We have a problem. Imagining, in March of 2011, an earthquake led to a tsunami that led to a nuclear reactor facility meltdown, that led to 19,000 people being killed, 6,000 injured, and over 245,000 people homeless. Our focus was on the victims. We had so many survivors, but that's not what we did, but it's what we had to do. My first introduction to a disaster was Christmas Day, 1974. Cyclone Tracy hit the city of Darwin in Australia. It was a Category 3 storm. The gale force winds extended 48 kilometres out from the centre. It was the smallest hurricane ever until, not, until 2008. Only 71 people died. But in the city of Darwin, 80% of all the houses were destroyed. 35,000 people were evacuated. 60% of those evacuated never returned to Darwin. In 1996, I was a captain in the army. I was deployed to, Banda Arche, uh, so to Banja Luka in Bosnia-Herzegovina. My mission was to show the benefits of peace. In all the disasters that I had responded to, I was focused on going to help the victims. But Bosnia flipped the, par flipped the paradigm. When I arrived in Bosnia, I was working with doctors, nurses, engineers, school teachers, farmers. They had all been traumatized like every other disaster. They were afraid, but they had ideas. They had plans of how to rebuild, how to recover. So it wasn't going in to help, it was going in to, uh, and asking, what do you need? I grew up in a small country town, Moolumba in Australia. In that small country town, there's not enough government people. There's not enough police, fire, ambulance, hospital people to respond to any disaster. Throughout that town, my town, we have a visualization of the 1954 flood. Worst flood ever. But with that visualization throughout town comes the stories of the people that lived through that. This is what happened. This is what we'll do next time. In 2017, the disaster we had that year was higher than the, than the 1954 flood. So we have a new worst case scenario. In a situation like this, if you tell the population the river is at 3.76 metres and is rising at 42 centimetres an hour and will peak at 5.28 metres, no. If you tell them and will be this far under the 1954 level. Madagascar, of all the storms that form in the Indian Ocean, 60% of them hit the island of Madagascar. Every year, the government has a plan. They run exercises, drills, simulations. They get everyone organized. But in 2007, when Cyclo sorry, in 2012, when Cyclone Giovanna hit Madagascar, there was a program in the schools run by UNICEF that delivered simple messages to the school teachers who then taught them to the kids. Put sandbags on the roofs of the houses. Reinforce the walls. Put personal belongings in plastic bags. Store water in containers that have lids. When Cyclone Giovanna hit Madagascar, there's always a day after. The day after that storm, the communities that had received those simple messages suffered less damage than those that had not. Through simple messages, we'd empowered the community to go and act and do other things as well. I'm not a builder, but every disaster I go to, natural disasters, war, civil unrest, 
damages buildings, damages infrastructure. My colleagues at Habitat for Humanity tell me to make a building stronger. A building that has a slope roof versus a flat roof where the wind can get up and rip it off is stronger with a slope roof. If you use longer nails, it makes the house stronger than shorter nails. If you replace the longer nails with screws, it makes the house stronger. If you use long threaded go, go bolts that bolt the roof to the walls, that bolt the walls to the foundation, it makes the house stronger. Every time there's a disaster, government talks about construction codes, building codes, but it takes years to implement those codes. Organizations are doing it now, making houses stronger, and they've shown through that response it's only adding on a thousand to three thousand dollars extra to the normal house. When we deal with disasters, we think about the first responders, the lights, the sirens, the uniforms, and in some cases that's true. But whether we're dealing with the wildfires in California of 2018, the earthquakes or tsunamis in Indonesia, or the civil unrest or the war like Bosnia, we know for every disaster that I've been to, the first responders are the neighbours, the bystanders, the volunteers, people that are willing to come and do something. In 2004, an earthquake led to a tsunami that impacted 14 countries. Over 280,000 people died. I was deployed to Banda Aceh. The death toll in Banda Aceh was 167,000. There was no tsunami early warning systems. As that Tsunami rushed across the Indian Ocean at 700 kilometers per hour without any warning. We saw some communities take action and respond and other communities not have that necessary knowledge. Look at the height of the water that came up on this house. This house is 3.2 kilometers from the sea. It's the day after the tsunami. There are survivors who are now prone to injuries through debris, through trash. What was interesting was that some houses remained and some houses were completely destroyed. What I saw in, in, in Indonesia in the time that I was there was the ability of the community to self-organize, the ability of the community to say, this is what we need to do we just need the resources to do it. Storytelling plays a really critical role in mitigating the risk for disasters. Again, the 2004 earthquake and tsunami. To the north of this map is Banda Aceh, where 167,000 people died. To the south is the island of Similu, a population of 83,000 and only seven people died. Why? Because the people on Similu experienced an earthquake and tsunami back in 1907. They told stories about that. So when the water recedes, they run inland up into the hills. In Banda Aceh, when the water receded, the people, out of curiosity, went down to the beach. In 2007, once again, I was deployed to Banda, sorry, to Indonesia. I arrived in Jakarta. I was given this map. The bird flu was everywhere. Had been laboratory confirmed in 30 of 33 provinces. The world was on the verge of a, what we thought was a global pandemic. The question was, we don't know where to start. We don't know what to do. The question that we posed was, what's being done at the community level? Through two organizations, the Indonesian Red Cross and Muhammadiyah. We engaged the community. We mobilized the community. With 80 master trainers, we trained 1,700 village, tra village uh, district village coordinators. 
those district trainers then trained and reached out to 25,000 village coordinators. Two years after this program started, they had reached over 27,000 communities. They had decreased the viral load. They had prevented what we thought was a potential pandemic. Again, in situations like this, we lack information. When I arrived in Indonesia, these were the maps that the government had, the before maps with very little information. Over a five to seven day period, we could engage the community and redo and build a map based on community intelligence, community information that provided us a necessary means of conducting risk assessments. Participatory risk mapping. This is a husband and wife that are writing and drawing and telling their story of how their chickens died and then how someone in their community became sick with bird flu and they subsequently died. And through that storytelling, we identify risk factors. And from the risk factors, we work with the community to identify the interventions to mitigate those risks to save livelihoods and to save lives. But I'm always surprised. Whenever I do a focused program, things like this happen. And one day we were driving in a remote area of Indonesia and this gentleman jumped out and went, Stop! You, you can't pass here. You've just stopped a United Nations convoy. What's going on? I'm the gatekeeper. I have to spray your car with bleach to prevent the spread of bird flu. And we all looked at each other and went, The program's not here. How do you know this? I saw it on television. I spoke to people in the, village, in the villages. I spoke to people in the communities. I spoke to people in the markets. The community had gone out and bought a backpack sprayer. They'd bought bleach. And his job was to stop movement of anything because movement of anything had been identified as the risk factor for spreading avian influenza or bird flu. The government mobilized 6,000 of their workers on the backs of motorbikes. They delivered, they developed storyboards which were visual, pictures, photos that identified the risks, how to mitigate the risk, and the interventions they could, everyone could do at their house, at the household level. When this program finished, the government came back and said, would this work for tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes? And yes, it did. I saw this in 2014 when I was deployed to West Africa for Ebola. When I treated Ebola patients, I wore personal protective equipment. But there was a group of ladies like Fatu Kakula who had seen us on TV. And she went to the market and she made her own personal protective equipment. And she successfully treated 24 Ebola patients, a disease that has no cure. When I went to and deployed for Ebola, we, were, we focused on the victims, the patients, the 11,000 that died but we had 17,000 survivors with a certificate. I survived Ebola. We had no program. We had no intervention. There was no focus on the survivors. In Bangladesh, a country that's prone to cyclones every year, the government had built over 2,000 shelters for the community. The challenge was getting the community to evacuate. 40,000 volunteers from the Red Crescent on bicycles, rode around Bangladesh with megaphones saying, you need to evacuate now, here's where you go, this is where the shelter is. Oh, they evacuated over 2 million people and saved so many lives. But again, when we have it, a hurricane, a cyclone, or any other disaster, and there's, a, there's a cascade of events. And just like the event in Bangladesh, the water's dirty. It's unsafe for drinking, and it led to vomiting, diarrhea, and a cholera outbreak. And the healthcare system was overwhelmed. And the people that had evacuated took their, their animals, their buffaloes, their cows, their goats with them as well. So when they came to the hospital with cholera, we also had all these animals to look after. Who did that for us? Volunteers from the community. This Mercy Corps graphic highlights everything I've learnt about force multiplication in disasters. When we're trying to quickly spread life-saving knowledge, you can start, we started off with 40 subject matter experts that trained 1,000 public health ed educators, 
that trained 2,500 local task force leaders, that trained 50,000 community volunteers, that changed the behaviour and impacted decisions made by over 2 million people. Hurricane Dorian recently hit the Bahamas. And once again, the focus was on what? The victims, the death toll, how many people died. This is the day after. In Marsh Bay, we saw the same thing in Mud Bay. We saw the same thing in, 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 in other parts of the Bahamas. Where was the focus on the survivors? Giving them life-saving skills, telling them what to do, helping them decide what to do. I want you to sit there now and think, what are the life-saving skills that each of you have individually to treat waterborne infections when the water's dirty and contaminated, to treat cuts, wounds, and broken bones, because we see that in every disaster, then to treat wound infections and prevent those wound infections to spread throughout the body to and prevent septus, cellulitis, and facetizing necrotitis, and other complications. How do we protect the children and the mums and other members of the community from mosquito-borne and insect infections? How do we protect them from exposure to sun, heat and cold, hypothermia and sunstroke? Because we're seeing creative ways to put technology like defibrillators like this. But have we created and designed and implemented action-oriented activities for the community? Are we empowered? Do we have the necessary life-saving skills for what we know happens in disasters. If a disaster happened today, here, right now, I want you to reflect on your skills, what you can do, what you can't do, because right now, if a disaster happens, we are all first responders.